On New Year's Day 1986, friends and family made a gruesome discovery when they found the body of 28-year-old Debbie Wolfe on the bottom of a pond near her cabin home in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Debbie was described by friends and co-workers as a loving, all-around happy person, which paid off in her work as a nurse in a veteran's hospital. But she had only been out of nursing school for two years by the time she went missing on December 26th, 1986. Debbie had spent Christmas Day with her family, but had had to head home so that she could make it to her shift at the hospital the next day. Co-workers would see her leaving the hospital at around 4pm and assumed that she was heading back to her isolated cabin home where she lived with her two dogs. Debbie loved her dogs and was known to take good care of them and the house that she lived in with family and friends describing her as neat and meticulous, which was why her mother was so concerned when she found Debbie's house in disarray on December 27th. Debbie had not shown up for work that day, and her family wasted no time checking in on her house only a few hours after Debbie had not shown up for her shift. Her house was in a complete mess. Her car was not parked in its usual spot, beer cans were littered throughout the cabin, and Debbie's nursing uniform was left lying on the floor in her kitchen. But things got even stranger. A friend of the family found her purse hidden under her bed, and then the family discovered that the seat of her car had been pushed all the way back. Debbie was only five foot three, and there was no way she could have driven the car with the seat being in the position that it was in. And then they found a message on Debbie's answering machine. This message made her friends and family incredibly nervous. First of all, because they did not recognise the voice of the man on the recording, and then because of what the message actually contained. Hey Deb, Miss you here at work today. I uh, just wondering how you're doing. Uh, if you're able to give me a call up here at the ward, I'm at day 227007, or I'll give you a call at home tonight. Uh, You've been out a lot of days, you may be worried when you miss another one. I just want to make sure you're okay. Bye. The man who'd left the message claimed to be a co-worker from the veteran hospital and said that he just wanted to check in with Debbie because she had missed so many shifts at work. Her family knew that that wasn't true, a fact that would later be confirmed by Debbie's co-workers at the hospital, and Debbie's mother immediately got in contact with the police. But she was met with a lacklustre response. She was told that Debbie would have to be officially missing for 72 hours before the police would open a missing persons case and begin looking for her. As if this wasn't enough, the police would only actually begin searching for Debbie five days after she went missing. When they did finally show up at her remote cabin on New Year's Eve 1986, they only did a search of her home, admittedly with bloodhounds, but the dogs couldn't pick up Debbie's scent and the search was called off for the day. According to investigators working within the department at the time, it had been mentioned by Debbie's family that a search of the pond had already been conducted, and so the police did not search the pond or order a dive team to search it that day. According to the family, nothing like that was ever said to the police, and Debbie's mother would actually hire her own private dive team to search the water the very next day. The important thing to remember about this pond is that it's surrounded by thick mud, both around the edges and going in quite a way into the water, and the bottom had a slow incline, meaning you could be five feet out into the water and it would only reach your knees. 
This information will be important later on and it also explains why one of the divers would only be in the water for two minutes before he made a discovery. He found two sets of footprints in the mud, heading towards the deeper water and what looked like drag marks, and he followed those drag marks and footprints until he found Debbie. She was inside a barrel at the bottom of the pond, with her eyes closed and her face slack and soft, almost like she was asleep. The police were quickly called back to the scene and took over the investigation once again. An autopsy revealed that there were no drugs or alcohol in her system. She had one teaspoon's worth of water in her lungs and her upper airways, and she had abrasions on several of her fingers that could have indicated that she had put up a fight. But her death was concluded to be an accidental drowning. The police believed that she had been playing outside with her dogs when she had fallen into the pond and, for some reason or other, couldn't get back out. The police had several theories to explain why she couldn't climb back out of the water, even though it would have only come up to her knees for the most part, and the first one was immersion foot. Immersion foot is typically when a foot or a body part has been exposed to cold temperatures, particularly water, for an extended period of time and then begins to swell or blister up and become sore, like trench foot. But immersion foot can also lead to things like disorientation and dizziness, and that was one of the things that police used to explain why she hadn't walked right back out of the pond and had actually ended up drowning. They also said that Debbie suffered from a bad back and that maybe she had fallen into the pond while playing with her dogs and her bad back had stopped her from being able to swim back out, especially because she was found wearing a big thick coat that would have become very heavy when wet. But her family and friends were unconvinced. First of all, there was the way Debbie had looked when she had been found. Drowning victims are usually found with their eyes and mouth wide open and their bodies, particularly their hands, stiff and tight because they're fighting to break through the water and to get somewhere where they can breathe again. But Debbie just looked like she was asleep. Another thing was that there was no foaming around her mouth or in her airways that would suggest that she was trying to breathe underwater. Her clothes and her body were clean, which was surprising as the water in the pond was murky and full of silt. And then there's the part of her being found inside a barrel. This part of the case would go on to create a massive amount of tension between Debbie's family and the police. The police would announce a few days later, after taking on the investigation, that there had never been a barrel, and it was actually Debbie's coat that had puffed up around the body and given that impression to the dive team. Debbie's family would disagree, and Debbie's mother would even go back to her cabin to look for the barrel, only to find an indentation in the ground, indicating that a barrel had been sitting there, but no barrel itself. The tensions between them would become even worse when the police returned the clothes that Debbie had been wearing when she'd been found. Debbie's mother would insist that these clothes did not belong to her daughter. The trousers were too big and too long. The shoes were three sizes too big and were men's. Her bra was also three sizes too big for her and no one in the family recognised either her t-shirt or her jacket. And the shoes particularly stood out to Debbie's mother. She even asked the police if anything had been done to them before they were given back to the family, and the police told her that it hadn't. The reason why Debbie's mother was asking was because the shoes were completely clean. There was no way Debbie could have walked through the mud either before getting into the pond or after to make it far enough into the water to where she could actually drown without getting these shoes dirty. This discovery only continued to ring alarm bells for Debbie's family, and they had more than a few ideas as to what they believed had actually happened to her. One of Debbie's roles at the hospital was to manage the volunteers, and Debbie had already told her family that she had been having problems with two men on the programme. 
One of these men had a history of psychiatric problems and had somehow managed to get her home phone number and had even told Debbie before that he knew where she lived. This man was questioned by police after Debbie's body was found, but he had an alibi and he actually left the state only a few days after questioning. The other man that Debbie had been having problems with had already confessed his feelings towards her several times, but Debbie had told him that she was not interested in a romantic relationship with him and wanted to remain friends. Debbie's mother actually believes that this second man was the one who'd left that message on Debbie's answering machine, but the police could find no evidence against him and he was released without any charges. And that's where Debbie's case remains to this day. The police still insist that her death was an accidental drowning and that her family were just desperate to prove that it was murder so they could blame someone for it. And most of her immediate family has, unfortunately, already passed away and they never got any answers that left them satisfied or even an answer that they could believe in when it comes to what happened to their daughter and sister. Thank you.